Hello, everybody, and welcome to Turn the Page. We're doing something special today here, Raps. You want to you wanna tell them what it is? I will! This is a Turn to Page double feature bonus episode. Oh. Where we're going to be covering the short-lived, critically panned Animorphs Alternamorphs Choose Your Own Adventure books. Yeah, I, I'm excited because I think I've always wanted to read more Animorphs than I had. But I also felt mm -hmm. the same way about Goosebumps, which is why, you know, Turn to Page sounded so fun in the first place with Goosebumps being the first premise. The fact mm -hmm. that there is what I consider to be such a close relative to Goosebumps just from mere placement on the shelf at the Scholastic Book Fair in like, mm -hmm. you know, they, they intersect. The fact that there is any Choose Your Adventure books for it is kind of nice. It feels kismet. And uh, I wish there were more than two, but I'm saying that before we read it. So, <laughs> so, so maybe we'll see. You'd mentioned wanting to read more of the Animorphs world. Yeah. How, how familiar are you with it? Not. I know that there are scary blue alien looking people. Also, actually, I see one on the cover. He's up there. Uh, I'm going to assume I'm going to take a shot in the dark. I think his name might be Tobias. <laughs> and I'm not kidding that that's my genuine oh. guess. <laughs> I know. I'm going to have to change Tobias's voice. If no, that happens but I don't even know if that's true. Because like I said, I... It's like, I liked Animorphs, so Animorphs sounded fun. And the thing about Animorphs mm. that was so cool is the covers, which, I gotta say, they kind of dropped the ball they on this one. They kind of dropped the ball! Like, they're, they were known for, you know, a kid doing an unfortunate pose as he slowly transformed into a red-tailed hawk going, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, and that was always the most evocative part yeah. of Animals for me, obviously. Yeah. It's, it's, you know, they tell you not to judge a book by its cover, but then yeah. they make such a gosh dang good cover. Exactly. I, th this is, I, from what I've heard from a lot of people, maybe you shouldn't judge, <laughs> you know, maybe you shouldn't judge Animals by the cover, <laughs> but like in, re <laughs> in reverse. But I've also, it's like, it's so exciting. It's such a tantalizing space for me because they play with a lot of strange story beats and themes that are like very serious and i'm mm. real like i'm really excited for what we're getting into because apparently I... the first alternate morphs covers kind of like the first book of of animorphs which is right. great because we are you know even I, i'm sure i read the first book but it was i was a young mm -hmm. as i have been before I... I was going to complete and will be again, but uh, <laughs> what are you going to do to me? That's how time works. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I mean, maybe in the uh, alternate morph, alternate dimension, which this is. This book apparently is a non-canonical uh, entry into Animorphs as well. So mm. don't don't worry if you were worried we were going to mess up the canon. That's not going to happen. I was terrified about that because, of yeah. course, I know these characters intently and well, uh, including Tobias, probably uh, the purple Tobias. stain. Jim the third <laughs> and the the owl bear that appears to be on the cover here. Uh, yeah. the, the final thing we'll mention you know, directly about the cover itself is yeah. uh, at the moment, it does not have your uh, typical, as yes. we mentioned, the, the, the morphing figurine on the front. Instead, it has what I can only say is like a high res version of an assy representation of a <laughs> lion's face. Yeah, uh, yeah. All with the A from Animorphs, except for a tiny little section on the nose that says, join us as a subliminal message. Oh, I put that there. That was, I was trying to get the, I was trying to get them to like, you know, follow the podcast. Mm, but then I realized that- I'm glad I said it, it out loud. Yeah, that's, that's what I was gonna say is I was like, but I was like, I guess, I, how subliminal can it be? Because, like, I know we're recording an audio <laughs> podcast and the cover says join us. Like, maybe maybe it still works. I don't know. Like, It's micro-targeted at me. <laughs> and unfortunately, I already follow. So it's got a 100% saturation rate. Yeah. But either way, uh, other than that, yeah, it's just kind of, it's a, it's a pretty regular cover, which, uh, yeah, is a bummer. Because the covers are super cool for Animorphs. In, in, a, in like a very 90s kind of cool way. Like a way cool kind of a way. 
Uh, mm-hmm. And for those of you who are listening on a podcast app that has the individual art for each oh, yeah. episode, I would recommend having a look at the art for this episode, which is very evocative of the Animorphs yeah. cover, courtesy of Sam Caron. Yeah. We we were rebellious and made it... We referenced the interesting covers instead of the boring one. But either way, I think that it's time to get into this. Uh, you want to take us I to the so. introduction? Absolutely. Okay, listen up. It's Jake. You probably already know what's going on around here. Just in case you didn't, though, here's the deal. Rachel, Tobias, Cassie, Marco, and Axe. Oh, also me, are five kids and one alien out to save the world. (laughs) No, this isn't a joke. It's real. About as real as you can get. Real enough for screaming nightmares about the things you've seen and done. Because sometimes the stuff you see in movies... The stuff you thought that could never, ever happen to you. Well, it can happen. It does happen. I've seen it. I can't tell you my last name. Or where I live. There's an alien invasion going on right here on Earth. But I'm not talking about little green guys with rain guns. I'm talking a much smarter way to conquer a world. Just invade people's brains. I'm not nuts. I've seen it. And because of that, my friends and I were given special power the power to morph into any animal we touch, to acquire its DNA. It's the only way we can fight the Yerks. That's what they call themselves. We have to find a way to stop these slugs that get into people's heads and make them slaves. But things have gotten worse. We need backup. A new Animorph. (laughs) We tried this once before and it didn't work out. At all. We're gonna try again. So, if you're interested in joining us, let's go. Just remember not to read these missions like a normal book. Check out the instructions and follow them. You get to choose your morphs, but I'm warning you now, choose them very carefully. You have to deal with the consequences. They can either help you or get you totally annihilated. This isn't a game. It's serious stuff. So if you can handle it, turn to page one. Oh, and one more thing. Good luck. You'll need it. Huh. So I will say right now, I think the alien is Axe. Axe <laughs> <laughs> does seem appropriate, yeah. But I do like it I being Tobias, tr- though. I don't trust Tobias. <laughs> I think it was more just like, I heard, I know that Tobias is an Animorphs character. Yes. Is I, this is this is like a this, this is an attempt to roll five dice and all of them come up sixes to possibly pull this from my memory. Yes. Is Tobias the one who stays as a hawk? <laughs> like he becomes a hawk for too long and then he's just a hawk? And <laughs> I think that sounds right. But spoilers, because maybe that happens in this book. Since, oh, you know, no! Who knows? Either way, uh, page one. You know you shouldn't be doing it. You were supposed to be home at least 20 minutes ago. It's getting dark. The smart thing to do, the only thing, really, is to ride your bike along the bike path like a law-abiding citizen, all the way home. But you don't. You're an (laughs) off-road cycling freak. (laughs) Okay, we're off to a great start. We made a good choice. So you head for the construction site across from the mall. How many times have you been told not to do that? Like a million. It's dangerous, your mom says. Deep pits filled with water, cinder block obstacles, dips and downhill runs. In other words, highly cool. Last Saturday, you chose a spot and yanked away the worst debris. You made the sort of single track loop, has a killer rolling dip and a log made out of cinder blocks that you can jump. When you're on it, you pretend that you're racing in one of the mountain biking clubs your mom won't let you join because they're too dangerous. Too dangerous? Just wait, mom, have I got a story for you. Only I can never, ever tell you or anyone else. Anyway, that night, there you are, going around and around the track, faster and faster, just barely enough light to see. Out of the corner of your eye, you spot some dark forms moving. You stop your bike, a little nervous. You think it could be a band of homeless men who live there, but then you recognize kids from school, kids you know, Jake, Marco, Cassie, Rachel, and Tobias. I'm going to say... Probably the fact that Axe is not one of the kids we recognize from school may seal the deal. Hmm. You don't know them well, except maybe Marco. He sits next to you in science and makes jokes under his breath all during class. 
Thanks to him, you're barely breaking a C. You think about yelling, Hey! But you don't want to scare them. And they look like, they look like such a group, somehow. You didn't know they were all friends. You feel a little bit left out. Even if they don't see you, you aren't terribly swell at making friends. Maybe because you spend most of your time riding around on a makeshift track. The group moves away, and you keep circling the track, trying to get in some killer laps before dinner. You're rounding the track for the last time, flying over the cinder block log when you see it. A light. It's moving fast. Way faster than an airplane or a helicopter. And you'd have to call the light blue. Even though you don't think you've ever seen that shade of blue. Somehow. <laughs> a blue that's almost white. Perhaps a light blue? And yet, it registers as more blue than any blue you've ever seen. That doesn't make sense. But neither does no, the light. No. <laughs> it's the next page but it also doesn't make sense you stand there your mouth open like a fish and watch it come closer you see that the light has a shape it's like an egg with two stubby wings the blue light is coming from a shaft at the end and suddenly you get what it is it's a ufo you know it and it isn't because you watch the x files it's because every hair on your head is standing on end Instead of running away like a normal person, you run towards it, you freak. <laughs> you keep out of sight behind a tumble of masonry and cinder blocks. That's when you see Jake, Tobias, Marco, Cassie, and Rachel. Rachel's hair is standing straight out from her head, so at least you're not alone. Your heart pounds as the UFO lands. The kids huddle together. You can can't hear them, but you know they're wondering what to do like you are. Then you hear Tobias's voice. Please, come out. We won't hurt you. I know. That voice was in your head. You didn't hear with your ears. Marco and Jake exchange glances. Tobias looks at Rachel. They all stare at each other, wide-eyed. They've heard it too. Tobias asks if the voice will come out, and he replies yes. He warns you not to be frightened. You peer through a crack in the half wall. The creature steps out of the ship, and for a minute, you think of a ballet dancer. Which is crazy, because these this creature has hooves. Four of them, and blue fur. And four eyes. Uh, two of them on little horns that come out of his head. Like a ballet dancer! A head with no <laughs> mouth? No wonder the guy talks to your brain. What? Why was our first... I mean, we'll get there, I'm sure, but why is our first thought ballet dancer? That is such a stretch. Oh, and We've seen ballet dancers like this before. And the tail! <laughs> you can't keep your eyes <laughs> off it! Or rather, the long stinger on the end of it that looks like it could do some serious damage. In a nice pirouette. Uh, here's the funny thing. You're not that scared. Not really. First of all, there's a nice solid wall between you and the alien, and somehow you suspect he won't harm you. You're right. You hear in your head. So you can come out. You don't have to hide. You gaze around wildly. Yes, I'm talking to you, he says. And that part about not being scared, forget about it. Now you're terrified. Turn to page four. Chapter two. Chapters? <gasps> In my choose-your-own-adventure book? Interesting. You step out from behind the wall. Whoa, Marco says. Another alien. Let the games begin. But his voice shakes a little, and you know he's scared, too. You stand next to the others, and the alien stumbles a bit and then falls, and you realize he's hurt. I am dying, he says. Then he tells you about the Yerks, how they've invaded Earth by taking over humans, how their slug-like bodies invade people's brains. It all sounds crazy and terrifying. You're relieved to hear that the Andalites, which is what the creature calls himself, are fighting the Yerks. That means somebody else is taking care of it, and you don't have to worry. Yes. Yes, you do. He is the last Andalite, he tells you. It may take a year before the rest of them return. By that time, the Yerks will have taken over Earth and all its people. What? You blurt out. That's impossible! I have seen what they are capable of, the Andalite replies. Then you turn, and you turn stone cold at the way he says it. There's one thing he can do before he... Wait, do to help before he dies. The Andalite directs Jake to fetch a small blue box from his ship. Jake looks a little nervous, but he disappears inside, then reappears holding the box. 
The Andalite tells you that he can give you the power to morph into any animal you choose. You just have to touch the animal to require its DNA. Wait. <laughs> what? <laughs> then don't touch it. <laughs> then don't touch it. If, if, if it doesn't require the DNA if you touch it, then obviously the rest of the book is going to be us not touching animals, right? Exactly. Uh, and becoming anything we should like. Yeah. You gotta uh, be kidding, Marco says. You can't believe it either. It's way past wacky, way past unreal. Suddenly, you see red lights in the sky, and Rachel sees them too. Yikes, the Andalite says. The hatred in his voice is like a living force. He calls the ships bug fighters. Hurry. Ooh, turn to page six. You place your hand on the box. We have not gotten to a choice yet, interestingly. Which, mm -hmm. I I wonder if it's just the setup or if it is going to be a little bit more story and then, like, we'll, just, we'll, just, we'll have to see. We'll see when we get there. You place your hand on the box next to the others. Six hands and then the Andalites. You feel a shockwave run from your fingers up your arm into your body. It doesn't hurt. It feels nice. Like a warm buzz of comfort. <laughs> <laughs> it's spelled comfort, but... F-R-O-T. Anyway, but then that might not be a thing from the book. That might just be but either way. But then the third ship appears alongside the red lights. It's larger, blacker than black. It's like a piece of a starless night sky. It is a strange shape. Jake says it's like a medieval battle axe rolling out from its surface is a feeling that you can only describe as evil. You've never felt this before, but you know what it is. Go now. The Andalite warns. They cannot find you. And remember, you can only stay in Adelmore for two hours or you'll be trapped in your moor forever. Now go. Visa 3 is with them in the blade ship. Run! Tobias stays behind for a moment, but the rest of you take off. You feel the urgency and the power of the Andalite's order. Suddenly, you're, you see your hand glow and you realize your hand is in a circle of white-hot light coming from the ship. A searchlight. You snatch your hand back and out of the light and run. With a burst of strength, the six of you leap over the half wall. Your knees hit the ground, but you can hardly feel the pain. Now the searchlight from the ship illuminates the dying Andalite. The bug fighters slowly descend. There's nothing you can do. Nothing. You watch as Visor 3 exits the Black Blade ship. You see the creatures called the hork Bajir, walking, we walking weapons with blades growing out of their wrists and elbows. They serve as hosts for the Yerks, and then, then the enormous spidery taxons, evil creatures who willingly allowed the Yerks to take over their brains and horrible bodies. <laughs> okay. <laughs> take over my horrible body. <laughs> <laughs> Have at me, and my flabby nothing. Fear you do you. with this what you will. <laughs> I'm done with it. Take it. <laughs> Fear grips you. You've never known fear like this. A hork bajir comes close, so close you could toss a stone and hit it. You hold your breath. You want to scream. You want to run. You have to get away. But you feel something warm seep in, like a curl of warm water swirling around in you. The Andalite has sent you courage. You need the courage, because you have to watch him die. In a sneering voice, Visor 3 calls him... Prince Elfengor, he morphs into a creature more horrible than the taxons, taller, bigger, with teeth three feet long. <gasps> Their points are as sharp as daggers. Page seven. Oh, my word. <laughs> the fight is horrible. Already dying, the prince fights bravely. You can see there's no hope for him, and there's no mercy in the Visitor Three. Cassie covers her eyes. Rachel stares straight ahead, her eyes blazing hatred. Visor 3 opens that deadly mouth with the teeth like steel spikes. Jake almost springs to help, but you help Rachel pull him back. No one can help. What are you going to do, Jake? At the very last moment, you turn away. You can't bear to see Prince Elfengor die. Not like that. But you hear it. You hear the scream in your head. It's more awful than anything you've ever heard. Tobias leans over and gags. The nearest hork Bajir turns at the sound. You see his eyes rake the darkness, and you know he's listening. Why is this scarier than Goosebumps? <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> this one's was not. This was not horror. 
you don't know who springs up first, but suddenly you can't contain the terror any longer and you have to t all take off. Running as fast Split. as you ever knew you could run. Split up! Jake yells, and you veer away from the others. You know the construction site pretty well. The prince has said that the hork bajir don't see very well in the dark, so you hug the shadows. You can hear one of them behind you, the blades whistling through the air. He's very fast. You stumble over a piece of rusted equipment, and the hork bajir is close, closer. He can't see you, but he can hear you. You stop. You press yourself flat against the wall behind you. A chunk of wall falls off and you catch it in your cupped palm. You break into a sweat, imagining the sound it would have made if it hit the ground, how the hork bajir would turn, how his blades would flash in the air before tearing you apart. Wait, it's a trick you've seen a million times in movies and on TV. Would you fall for it? Then again, do a hork bajir watch TV? You grasp the stone in your fist. With your best effort, you draw back and fire the thing like a fastball way off to the right. You hear the soft clunk as it falls. The hork bajir whips his horned head around and takes off after the sound, bounding like a kangaroo. Quick, touch him. Wait, no, never mind. Don't touch him. Then we'd require. Uh, you run to the opposite direction. Your lungs are on fire, but you have to keep going. You vault over cinder blocks and debris. You swing over half-built walls. You get your mountain bike and swing one leg over. And then, you really fly. Turn to page eight. Do we really fly, though? Because we are reading a book where we have to, like, I gotta know. Did I actually become Kaka? I I was hoping we would get clarification yeah. immediately on this page. However, we I, wake up the next morning. Yeah, I, I have a sneaking suspicion we did not actually really fly, but that would have been fun. Chapter three. Three chapters in. No choices. Oh, we're getting there. Oh, we're almost there. <laughs> We're almost at choices, okay. You wake up the next morning feeling groggy. It was a dream, of course, a totally freaky dream that felt totally real. The worst nightmare you ever had. If you told your mom about it, she'd probably suggest counseling. You can hear the vacuum going outside your door and you feel better. Vacuuming is so normal. How can people go on vacuuming when horrible alien slugs are invading their brains? You peek outside the door and your mom is vacuuming and your little sister runs out in a pink dress. How's this? Lexi asks. It's fine, honey, Mom says without even looking. You remember that Lexi's birthday party is that day. That reassures you. That reassures you, too. Yesterday, a six-year-old birthday party would have been lame. Today, you think it's just the coolest thing in the world because it's normal. Your mom sees you. Can you keep an eye on things here? She asks. I have to go to the store and pick up some cake. You're picking up the cake? You ask. Your mom never buys a store-bought cake for birthdays. She's a city planner and works constantly, but she also has a thing about home-baked cakes. Emily's coming over to help, but after the party, we're going to a meeting tonight. Mom tells you. Can you babysit? Sure. You say on the way to the kitchen. Babysitting beats dodging aliens, you think. Not that you dodged an alien with killer blades coming out of the wrists or elbows last night. No way! It was a dream. You chomp away on cereal, but it tastes like sawdust. You keep you keep hearing Prince Elfengor's dying scream. You remember those dagger teeth and what they did to him. The spoon clatters in the bowl as your stomach heaves. You bend over, your face buried in your knees. You take a deep breath. And that's when Marco walks into your kitchen. Really? Really? Come on now. You don't have to bow. He says. A simple Lord Marco will do. <sighs> Very funny. You say. I felt kind of dizzy for a minute. Should this not set off an alarm about it being real immediately since we didn't know Marco? Wait, mm -hmm. no, we... Oh! I mean, no, or no, was Marco the, Marco was the only one we knew. But only, yes. it sounded like it was only passing and not like walking to my kitchen unannounced. But... It, it, I, I got it as more of a, a long-lived friendship between those two. Oh, okay, okay. I did not. I did not pick up that energy from Marco. Marco has to win me over. Marco slings one leg over a kitchen chair. That did it. I'm in. I mean, <laughs> I mean, look, I'm slinging my one leg over this kitchen chair. You see how cool I am, but it isn't every day you see an alien prince get turned into McFood, you know. He says. So it wasn't a bad dream. You mutter. Not only that, it gets worse. Marco tells you. While you've been snoring, 
We be morphing. You stare at him. No way. Way. He says, tossing his long, longest hair behind his <laughs> single longest hair <laughs> behind his shoulder <laughs> that he meticulously picked out from his head of hair. This one's the longest. That's so hair. cool. He threw it over his shoulder. That's such a cool thing to Whoa. do. <laughs> oh my god. He just that knew which one was the longest. That's crazy. Okay. I've been designated by our fearless leader, Jake. To recruit you. So far today, Tobias has turned into a cat, Jake into the family dog, and Cassie into a truly awesome horse. I don't believe you, you say. Yeah, well, I didn't want to believe it either. Marco says, shrugging. Considering that I'd like to remain alive long enough to get into an R-rated movie, but apparently everything that Prince Alpha Diddle told us is true, which means we're all in big trouble. You mean there might be controllers around? You whisper. Closer than you think. Marco says, reaching for a banana. Like Jake's brother. When I told Jake I thought Tom was a controller, he went postal. I have the jaw to prove it. Marco rubbed his chin. But it's the little things you notice. Tom just hasn't been acting like Tom. He goes to this meeting called The Share and it sounds totally bogus, but we're all going tonight. Jake says you should come too. At least it'll get me out of babysitting. You say? Man, we're just trying to trade up that ladder. Like when you go to like a like a flea market and you start with a a pin and you're trying to mm -hmm. trade up to the it just I mean, hey, just accept babysitting at this point. <laughs> Mark, yeah, exactly. I mean, this I is mean, the yeah. appropriate level of responsibility for us. Yeah. Marco peels the banana and begins to eat. Suddenly, he bends his knees and lopes around the kitchen, making monkey noises. You stare at him. <laughs> yeah, just kidding, just kidding. He, he says, grinning. I don't have a monkey morph yet. Just want you to stay on your toes. Marco leaves, and you start thinking about what he said about controllers. If Jake's brother Tom could be one, so could someone in your family. What about Mom? She bought a cake for your sister's birthday. Sure, it wouldn't sound like a big deal to most people, but you know how weird it is. She hardly noticed Lexi's party dress. Plus, didn't she say something about going to a meeting? What if Mom is a controller? And if she is, how can you find out? Turn to page 10. <gasps> choice, choice, choice. You decide to try your first morph and attend your sister's birthday party undercover. You have three choices. We can be a fly... Uh, and go to the next page. Your sister's pet hamster on page 13. Or your weird next door neighbor's pet ferret on page 15. Do you have... This is not a... This is not a for the strategy of the book. This is a... Mm. Which of these three would you like to pick? Because I have one strongly. And it's not... I close. will forfeit as I do not have a strong... Please. But do you have a strong one for like between if you if you personally Rhapsody not in this book in, in this situation could pick between mm. being a fly a hamster or a ferret do you in your life have a choice between those Yeah things? it's ferret. Okay, thank god. That I 100% I think it's the correct choice. Hell yeah. I think hamsters are cool but they're just like less cool, less long ferrets. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, they're significantly less agile ferrets. I will say that being a fly does sound like a relative. Well, it also sounds like a quick way to get killed. It sounds a bit risky. That's why I'm landing on that one as well. <laughs> Nobody's gonna swat a ferret. I hope. Mm. Book. All right. You've always liked ferrets, and it's pretty cool being one. You can't see very well, but your hearing is quite excellent, and you feel so happy. Playful as a kitten, but friendly like a dog. You leap up on an ottoman, twinkle across the back of a sofa. Being a ferret's fun. It wasn't hard to get the morph. You waited until Miss Humphreys went next door to complain. She left the back door open, and it was easy to slip inside and pick one of it, the sleek, furry creatures. Sorry, there's so many typos in what is, I'm going to assume, the transition from that physical book into the PDF form. Mm. And it says, but it does say furry creatures. 
<laughs> and I have I have to let that known to the be known to the world that it says furry creatures because I had to viscerally stop myself from saying it the first time. Mm -hmm. It happily curled up next to your chest while you acquired its DNA. What a sentence! You sh you shrank rapidly, your body turning sleek and supple. Your you grew fur and whiskers and tiny claws. As soon as you morphed, you wanted to play with the other ferrets. The three other ferrets. They were confused to see you, but they came over to sniff you and chase you around the room. The back door slams. Miss Humphreys stumps back in, a ferret draped across her chest. She looks at the ice cream cake in her hand and shrugs. She dumps it into the kitchen trash can. Empty calories, she mutters. Not necessary. <laughs> Don't buy it. it. Is that a controller thing to say? Or is the ferret lady even weirder than you thought? Everybody likes ice cream cake. You curl up under the sofa so that she won't notice that she has one extra ferret. But she doesn't pay attention to her pets anyways. Another ferret brushes against her legs. She doesn't pick it up and doesn't coo at it, doesn't stroke it. Weird or standard, standard operating procedure. The phone rings. Miss Humphreys snatches it up. Yes? A pause. Yes, I'll be there. No, I won't attract attention, she says, sounding irritable. No more than usual. This host is apparently an eccentric. This host? She's a controller. You shrink back under the sofa. You hear a creak above you as she sits. You see her feet, <laughs> her feet in thick soled loafers. She doesn't move and doesn't move. What time is it? How long have you been in the morph? You only have two hours. You watch as the shadow moves slowly across the floor. How can you get out of the house without her noticing you? The shadow touches the toe of her shoe and she gets up. Time, she mutters. She stumps around the room and you creep forward to watch. She slips into her coat, picks up a nearby canvas tote bag. She starts for the door and opens it. You can sneak out. You dark forward. But she suddenly spins around. Ferret lady. She murmurs. Travels with a pet all the time. <laughs> what is happening? And before you can move or react, she reaches down and sweeps you up in one hand. She pops you into the tote bag and she zips it partly shut. You can stick your nose out, but that's all. You're trapped and the clock is ticking. Miss Humphreys tosses the tote bag in the front seat of the car. You hitch your head on the door handle and the car jerks forward. You try and work the zipper with your paws. No go. How long do you have left? You can barely see the car clock. 20 minutes. Too close for comfort. The car stops. Miss Humphrey slings you over her shoulder. You poke your nose out. You're in the beach parking lot. She's going to the sharing meeting. At least the rest of the Animorphs will be there. Miss Humphreys plops the bag down on the sand and she trudges off to speak to a knot, a knot of people by the volleyball net. Ten minutes left. You wiggle your nose through the opening, thrashing your head to widen the gap. The zipper gives a bit. Not much, not enough. You hear Cassie's voice nearby, and then you remember that you can use thought speak. Cassie, Cassie, it's me. I'm in the ferret morph. What? You hear Cassie say. I didn't hear anything. Someone replies. You realize that Cassie can't thought speak back, and she can't talk out loud or look suspicious. Cassie? I'm in a tote bag lying on the sand. I can't get out. My morph time is up. I think I'm near the volleyball net. Help! Turn to page 17. You hear the scrunch of the sand. You see bare brown toes. Cassie's concerned face suddenly looms in your vision. Is that you? She whispers. It's me! Hurry! Cassie unzips the tote and casually tucks you under her arm. She strolls up towards the dunes. Almost done. There, she murmurs. She climbs over the dunes and sets you down. She looks around. O okay, hurry. You don't need her to tell you. You concentrate and you feel your legs getting longer. The fur on your skin grows patchy. Your ears grow rounder. Your tail shrinks. You become less supple. <laughs> Cassie wrinkles her nose. <laughs> Ooh, that's the worst morph I've seen so far. Sorry to disappoint you. You say, glad to feel that you have a mouth. Bears have mouths. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I haven't had much real practice. 
Rachel appears over the dune. Hurry up, guys, she says in a low tone. Jake is going to morph into his dog, Homer. Dogs and cats and ferrets, you say, suddenly feeling hopeless. What a bunch of feeb morphs. <laughs> How are we going to fight Visa 3 with those? I have known Phoebe for two seconds, and I cherish it. I hope it is not a translation issue, and that it is a just a funky way of saying feeble. Mm -hmm. So bad. I, like that. I think it is, and I love it. If Something, it isn't in the original book, it now it is, must be. It is now. Oh, Something fierce flashes in Rachel's eyes. You glimpse something you've never before seen in a pretty in the pretty popular Rachel. The girl is a warrior. You've got a point, Rachel says. Chapter 7. Dang, what? <laughs> Things happen when... We got the right one! Yeah. Things happen... Probably, I assume. So yeah, I wonder, is it a... Do you presume it's a book with one correct ending? I think so. I'm getting that vibe that it's one of those where, yeah, you're trying to get to the correct path. But maybe not. Maybe not. Maybe there's... I guess... Because in my head, in my normal book head, I'm like, yeah, we're going to go chapter 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. But we skipped mm. chapters, didn't we? Am I... Maybe. Why? I don't know. Yeah. Either way, it doesn't matter. Things happen way fast after the meeting at the beach. Too fast. Jake morphs into a lizard and spies on Mr. Chapman, the assistant principal. He finds out that one of the entrances to the year pool is in your very own school. Every year, cast a visit the pool every three days in order to soak up Kendrona rays. <laughs> yes. When Jake fills you in, you can't believe it. The whole thing sounds nuts to you. But since your life has suddenly turned crazy, every word rings true. Rachel has taken your complaint about Phoebe morphs and yes! run with it. Yes! yes! The plan is to collect wild creature morphs at the gardens. Since Cassie's mother works there, you can get behind the scenes and try and acquire some truly fierce DNA. <laughs> Turn to page 18. That is, if you don't get caught, you meet up with all the others at the gardens. Okay. Cassie says, after you get your admission tickets. Just stay close. You follow her into the main building. It's been fashioned into a rainforest with animals in their natural habitats. Cassie leads you through an unmarked door. You stop, confused. Suddenly, you're in industrial city. Gray walls, concrete floors. After the sights and sounds of the rainforest, the contrast makes you dizzy. Cassie points to the doorways. These lead to the exhibits, she explains. You... <laughs> Sorry see something coming up and i like it you nod mm -hmm. but you can't quite imagine opening opening one and popping in to say hello to a tiger or a grizzly bear -a. <laughs> <laughs> how do you guys feel about gorillas cassie asks you think she's kidding but she hands marco an apple and before you know it he's actually touched his huge gorilla this huge, his huge gorilla, gorilla called Big Jim. Wow, sorry. He acquires his DNA. This gives you all courage somehow. One of you came close to a wild creature and survived. I say we head for the big exhibits, Marco says. We need firepower. You start to head towards the big creatures, but you hear a whirring sound. A golf cart is coming your way. A security guard. Split up, Cassie hisses. She takes off with Tobias and Rachel. Jake and Marco are already running. You spin around and run back the way you came. You hear the golf cart behind you, and you fake a left and go right. The corridors are amazed, but this helps you. Before too long, you've lost the guard. Now what? I wish Cassie were here to tell you what's behind the doors. You open one cautiously. At first, all you see are treetops. The door opens out onto a little ledge, concealed by leaves. It's high above the habitat of the animal, whatever animal that is. You peer down. Something moves at your level, and you jump back in alarm. A giraffe is almost eye level with you. It turns velvety brown. its velvety brown eyes at you and blinks its long eyelashes. Turn to page 19. Hey there, you say softly. You shake the tree branch a little. Somewhere you've read that giraffes feed on treetops. You don't think they attack humans, you hope? The giraffe takes a delicate step towards you, and it passes by you, so close you can smell the dusky fur. 
You put out a tentative hand and touch its flank. The giraffe stops moving. So this is it. This is the trance. So strange that you can put such a large, strong creature to sleep. You cl- What? Yep. <laughs> when, when did this Apparently. happen? <laughs> this really does feel like they've condensed the first book into part of this book. <laughs> <laughs> you close your eyes and concentrate. When you're done, you pat the giraffe gently. Thanks. You say. You slip back inside the corridor. That encounter went so well that it gives you confidence. You continue down a sloping ramp, and when it comes to the next door, you open it and slip inside. You're in a savanna. Dry trees, sand, hot, but a dry heat. You don't see the animal at all, but you hear it. Raps, you want to take this? The cry raises the hair on the back of your neck. It's close to human. The animal's wavering on front legs, the fur sandy-colored and coarse. You don't think you've ever seen an uglier animal. She should be done by now, a voice says. Quickly, you crouch down behind some food bins as, as the door opens. Two it white tights of Sorry. jacketed workers come in. <laughs> it tights a few minutes, the other one says. We'd better wait until she's completely out. Are you kidding? I wouldn't go near her high enough otherwise, the other man says. He peers into the enclosure. Okay, she's down. Okay, let's go. The vet's waiting. Oh, darn, I left the stretcher by the elevator. Well, I'm not staying here alone. The two workers exit and you creep towards the sleeping hyena. Just as you approach, it opens one eye. The look is deadly, like a shark's. As if your only worth is for food. It's too late to run back now, so instead you gather your courage and brush your hand along the creature's side. The eyes close. Your touch, combined with the tranquilizers, has made the hyena pass out. You concentrate, and as soon as you're done, you run away. Fast. When you close the door behind you, the white-jacketed workers are heading towards you with a stretcher. Turn to page 20. Hey! One of them calls. Stop! The other one says. They toss aside the stretcher, and they start to run towards you. You could wait and think of a story, but it seems easier to just run. Chapter 8. You sprint around a corner, straight into a security guard. Whoa! He says. Two strong hands grip your arms. And where are you going? The workers come up behind you. They're both out of breath. <laughs> Tried to break into the hyena habitat. One of them says, gasping. The grip tightens. So, what's your name, kid? You think about telling the truth. Well, not the whole truth, but at least you could say you know Cassie's mom. The only trouble is that that might get Cassie in trouble. And it could bring too much attention to the others, so you say nothing instead of making a choice in a Choose Your Own Adventure book. He frowns. Uh, we got reports of vandals in the park, so come along with me. He marches you down the corridor into a small waiting room. There are two policemen there. Right, just what you need. I know you were called about a disturbance by the snack bar, the security guard says. But no name here was caught sneaking into the animal habitats. The taller policeman sighs. Obviously, he doesn't want it the burden of some kid. Let's move, he says. They keep you between them as they march you outside to a loading area behind the snack bar. A police van is parked there. On the side of the van are the words K-9 unit. Strange thing for a kid to be sneaking in animal cages. One policeman says. They're not cages, the other one says. They're habitats. Whatever. Sit here. The taller policeman puts a hand on your shoulder and shoves you down on a bench. And don't think about moving. Rincey and Gail won't take to that kindly. Turn to page 21. Oh. Two German shepherds bound out of the police van and sit in front of you. One of the dogs bears its teeth. Stay, the policeman says, and moves off to go talk on the van radio. You've got to get away. In just a few hours, you're supposed to meet the others at school to invade the Yerk pool because of the photon rays. Your only choice is a morph. But what is the best way to get away from the cops? You have to make a choice fast. Well, the backs return, you choose a hyena on the next page, a canine police dog, or a giraffe. Some of these feel, one of these feels very strange to me for this situation. Yeah, I don't understand how being a giraffe is going to yes. help me here. I, 
would we not just get brought back to the cage? Mm-hmm. It seems seems unwise to me. So that does kind of narrow it down to hyena or police dog. Mm. And I have a slight... Well, I, the thing is, I have a lean in both directions. The lean for the hyena is we already know that the the workers are terrified of hyenas and like i wouldn't go anywhere near that unless it was you know sleeping whereas the canine police dogs it's possible that the cops think that they have them well trained and so aren't necessarily scared of them in any way however there's also the other side which is like they might feel an allyship to the canine police dogs whereas they might yeah. just put down the hyena that's kind of that is where I'm leaning. It my mentality is like I'm trying to envision I can't envision giraffe going any way except for we get put back in a cage. Yeah. Hyena, I could see us being put back in a cage. I could also see us being put down. I do not see a world in which they either put the police dog in an exhibit or put it down. <laughs> so that's just why I I see less ways that uh, the police dog can go wrong mm -hmm. is all that. That's my only lean to that one over anything else. But I think, I think it's between hyena or police dog, unless this book is wrong. <laughs> let's, let's do it. Let's join the Paw patrol. Oh, all right. Chapter 10. You reach out and touch the canine dog. Princey's coat. The dog closes his eyes and you concentrate. The police have their backs to you. It's now or never. There's that strange sensation again of bones. What? A bones crunching. Things growing that shouldn't be growing. <laughs> you touch your ears and feel fur. You suddenly drop down on all fours and notice that you have paws instead of hands and feet. And the smell. You smell everything. Food, people, animals. It's overwhelming at first. The other dogs cock their heads and look at you curiously. The one called Princey smells you and howls. After all, she's smelling herself. The two policemen look over. Hey, Cedar, the taller one says. Thought you only brought two dogs. Must have loaded a third. Hey, the kid's missing. They rush over. You stand alert, tail twitching like the other dogs. You're not just a dog. You're a cop. <laughs> you have discipline. <laughs> it's a good morph, you tell yourself. Who's a good morph? You tell yourself, <laughs> in a minute, they'll give up on a harmless kid who stuck a toe in the wrong habitat. Big deal. It's not like you're a big, bad criminal. They'll load you into the van, take you back to the station, and you can take off from there. This isn't good, Findlay. Seidel, Seidel, Seidel says. We're supposed to be on alert. Findlay answers, frowning. <sighs> Especially for kids. Especially for kids? What? Here's a shoe! One of them has spied your sneaker. The dogs can track the kid! He holds the sneaker under your nose. Scent roars in. Your scent! Oh, been there. The other dogs smell the strain at the- they then strain at the leashes. We'll keep the one offline and see what happens, Finley says. The two dogs take off and you follow, your no nose on the ground and in the air. Incredible! You can smell yourself. You can follow the air currents. Know where you walked and where you stopped. The dogs follow your trail to the admission booth. They circle, and you do too, of course. You know which way you went. You go the opposite direction. But the other two take off down the sidewalk. Darn! <laughs> Just like out, trying to outsmart dog as dog. I do like that. Mm -hmm. You bound up behind them while the two cops hold the leashes. Why don't you walk on the sidewalk? That would have confused the scent. Instead, you add stuck to the grassy part near the curb. The dog can smell your trail easily. They picked it up, Seidel says. He sounds relieved. More relieved than he should sound, since he's only tracking a kid. Chapman says at least one of the kids infiltrated the sharing meeting, Finley says. The policemen are controllers, and they'll follow your scent straight to your house, to your family. I reported the kid who was hanging around the dunes, Seidel answers. Uh, the others are going to pick her up. It won't be long before she's one of us. Cassie. She was the one who hung around the dunes, watching over Jake and his dog morph. Cassie was in danger. You have to warn her, warn the others. The, others, the other dogs lose your scent, and you almost lose it yourself. 
You're in a more trafficked area of town now, near the Civic Center. Earlier, you stopped at the center garage to leave a note in your mom's car. You said you'd be late for dinner, even later than you'd thought. You hurry past the garage, but the other dogs suddenly pick up your scent. They race into the garage, and the cops follow, running after them. This isn't good, Seidel says in a low voice. You pick up his words easily with your dog hearing. <laughs> Visa 3 won't lock it, Finley says in a worried tone, easily understandable with your dog hearing. So we won't tell him? The dogs lose the scent amidst the oil stains and the gasoline. They circle around, confused, but any minute they could find your mom's car. The note that you left still might be tucked under the windshield wiper, and it wouldn't take the cops long to figure out who you are. This is your only chance. You leap forward, barking as if you picked up the scent. You charge out of the garage. The other dogs follow. You know that you can't lead them completely astray, so you follow the route back to your neighborhood. You run flat out now so that the others have trouble keeping with you. But you make sure that they will keep you in sight. Turn to page 26. You get to the ferret lady's house and bark furiously outside. You circle the house and find the pet the pet door. You nose it open and bound inside, and the cops catch up and pound on the door. The ferret lady answers. But already you've caused a commotion. The ferrets are running crazily around the furniture. The cat is hissing, hissing and spitting. The other dogs add to the chaos. What is it? The ferret lady shouts over the din. We're chasing a kid. The cops trying to describe you. Oh, sounds like every kid in this neighborhood. The ferret lady sniffs. I don't care if Mr. Three himself asks me. I'll say the same. So far, so good. You've confused them. I will say it's interesting that every hunch that we've had that someone might possibly be mind controlled has just 100% been accurate so far. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's impressive. <laughs> like, we are, we should be a, we should be a dog cop. <laughs> like, <laughs> as far as I'm concerned, we did pick the right morph. Uh, so far, so good. You confuse them on the cover cast to sneak outside the pet door again. You bound next door. You remember you le left a sweatshirt outside after gardening chores this morning. You grab it in your mouth and race off. You take that sweatshirt all over the neighborhood, rubbing it against trees and sidewalks and grass. Soon you see the cops and the canine dogs again. The dogs are running and barking and running from place to place with the cops strained to hold on to the leashes. You keep hidden and watch the cops get thoroughly confused. They give up. And you trot back home, because time is almost up. You morph back into a human form in your garage, and you hurry inside to call Cassie. But everyone's left already. If you rush to school now, you could blow their cover. There's got, there's got to another way. There's got to! There's absolutely got to another way. There can't just be this feeb way. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> Good morph choice. You deserve to proceed. Turn to page 28. Why didn't they tell us that with the ferrets? We didn't deserve we didn't deserve to proceed there. No, they generously let us. Yeah. It's getting late. Oh, chart, chapter 12. Uh, it's getting late and you're freaked. Cassie's in danger. Should you head over to the school and try and hook up with the others? You can't stay here while the other anamorphs put their We've never decided on that name, have we? But I guess we have. Put their lives on the line. There's a suspicion that's been nagging at you. During the chase, the policemen look very nervous at the parking garage. They mother muttered about Visor 3. What if something strange is going on there? It's only a little bit out of your way, so you decide to investigate the garage before heading to school. The garage is used during the day for city government work workers. Right now, it's pretty deserted except for a security guard. You duck behind a car and wait until he heads down the ramp towards the entrance. You're about to explore when you see the guard weave in a large black van with tinted windows. Curious. You watch as the van heads up the ramp. Instead of parking, the van pulls up directly in front of the elevators. A group of people get out, and you recognize Jake's brother, Tom. Controllers. Someone pushes a button to summon the, ele summon the elevators. You know you have to follow the group, but you can't stay in human form. Tom would recognize you. You have to try and morph, but what should you choose? You have to make a decision, and fast, you choose! To use the ferret morph, go to the next page. To use your canine German shepherd morph, go to page 35. Do you have a lean? Mm -hmm. I mean, we just were a dog is the thing. I. How likely is it that it's the right choice again? I know. The metagamer in me says we shouldn't use the same morph twice. And also, where is... 
what's the implication about do we know what kind of setting this meeting is taking place in is it indoors i thought it was on the beach i thought it was on the beach too but then i thought we were at the beach and then i well i guess yeah so i guess it, i don't know i guess it could be either in that setting but I it's it's possible that it's it's multiple different like or rather I I believe it to be multiple different meetings that is like recurring consistently and we've yeah. looked over yes. one of them and that's when we met Cassie in the dunes and decided to go and get yeah, more powerful uh, morphs less feeb morphs rather yeah yes less feeb morphs uh I mean sounds like we're both leaning ferret for yep maybe metagamey reasons but I I think it's good enough mm -hmm. chapter thirteen. You're concealed in a dark corner of the garage, and you feel the ground rush up at you as your bones compress. <laughs> Ferret! <laughs> Hair grows on your hands, on your face. Your nose twitches, and your body becomes sleek and supple. And the ferret mind urges you to play. There are so many things to investigate in the garage. Wonderful smells, things to eat. You wrench your ferret brain under control. Keeping to the wall, you get closer to the group. The elevator dings. And the first group crowds on. You sl you slink closer. Do you dare risk boarding the elevator? The lights on the elevator are bright, and you'll probably be noticed. Normally, humans would scream if they saw a furry creature in a small space with them. But you have a feeling controllers wouldn't care. And besides, you have no choice. What is this, a choose-your-own-adventure book? You slink <laughs> in between the legs of the controllers and head for the corner. The doors close. We have company, one of the controllers says, and they all look down. Oh, it's not a cat, someone says. It's not a dog, someone else observes. The controller who seems to be in charge turns and gives you a dismissive glance. Catch it. I'll throw it down the shaft. Busted. You can't react or they'll suspect something. Wait a second, Tom says. I seen that animal. It's a ferret. Belongs to Humphreys. Maybe we shouldn't touch it. Chapman said to take no chances. All right. The other controller turns back, already bored with this conversation. You're safe. For now. The elevator indicator lights up the sublevel floor, and it's as far down as the parking garage goes. But the controller hits a series of buttons, and the elevator doesn't stop. It keeps going down. The door opens onto a room that seems to be carved out of dirt and rock. Sheetrock is nailed up against the walls. You slink out of the elevator and follow the group to a concealed door that leads to an iron staircase. You go down, 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 and your eyes adjust to the light. And your nose picks up the smell of dampness. You hear something. A comforting sound that reassures you for a moment, like waves against a shore. Turn to page 30. But then you hear the screams. <laughs> <laughs> Human cries of anguish, suffering, and you pick up a horrifying familiar smell. Taxons. You don't want to see what's ahead. You don't want to move. Dread fills you. It's so much more enormous than being afraid of a test or the dentist. <laughs> You've only hesitated a moment. But the controllers have disappeared around the turning. You dart forward. The first thing you get hit with is how huge the space is. It's maybe three times the size of the mall, and it's completely open and carved out of rock and earth. There are still enormous pieces of earth-moving equipment down there, as though the space is constantly being expanded. You notice other staircases winding up and disappearing. There must be secret entrances all over town. The Yerks are much more numerous than any of you had imagined. Then, you notice the cages. They're filled with humans and hork bajir women, children, men, some of them screaming, some of them just sit numbly. Taxon and hork bajir patrol outside the cages. Occasionally, one of the hork bajir lashes out with a tail blade and rattles the cage. The humans shrink back, and the year controlled hork bajir let out the huffing sounds that must be laughter. As you watch, one of the hork bajir opens a cage that lets, leads out and leads out a woman. She struggles, and the hork bajir casually holds a bladed wrist to her throat. You have no doubt he would slash her in a second. The hork bajir leads her onto the pier and goes over to the pool that looks like it's filled with moving sludge. He forces her head under the surface. When he jerks her head back up, you see a, sli a gray, slimy thing finish slithering inside her ear. And the woman doesn't struggle anymore. And then you see Tom again. His head bent over the pool, the same slimy thing, slides out of his ear. 
and immediately he begins to scream. You can't hear the words, but you can imagine. The hork bajir puts a blade to his throat. It takes the three, three of them to get to a cage and throw him inside. You feel sick. Sick to your bones. You can't fight this. Sick to your furry little ferret bones. You can't fight this. You should turn around and go back up while you still can and wait to fight another day. Because it's hopeless. You didn't think it would be possible. You didn't think it was possible, but you want to give up. Then you see Cassie. She's being held with the other humans, waiting for a yerk slime to invade her brain. Guarding her are two hork bajir and taxon. It's still hopeless, but rage fills you and sends your blood pounding, and you're ready to fight. Once again, as a ferret. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, really... no, 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 Rita, we're going to fight this draft. Oh, whip with the neck. <laughs> exactly. I'm with it. I'm with it. When it's an option, I'm with it. You scamper down the steps. No one notices you as you dart across the floor. You look like a mole or another creature of the underground. A breeze tickles your fur and whiskers. A breeze? Down here? You look up. A hawk has just flown over your head and it circles in the air above Cassie. Tobias, is that you? Who is it? It's me. I'm a ferret again. Cool? Tobias answers. We need all the help we can get. The others are about 20 foot behind you. We have to save Cassie. Keep an eye on her. I'll be back. You scurry across the floor towards the others. Hey, it's me! You call in thought speak. Look down! Marco almost jumps to the ceiling. Hey, come on! Why'd you have to pick a rat? He whispers. I'm not a rat. I'm a ferret. I'm closer to a cat or a dog than a rodent. I like humans! I don't bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, great. Marco mutters. A rodent who pretends to be a dog. Just what we need. You know, I could always make an exception with a biting pin. <laughs> you add. Jake bends down to speak to you. If I were you, I'd morph back to human. You might need a better morph than a ferret. This place is crawling with Taxon and hork Bajir. All right. You say. But Jake, I saw Tom. He's here. In a cage. I saw him. Jake says tersely. His face tells you everything. You can't imagine how awful it must be to see your brother like that. You scurry behind a storage shed. Quickly, you morph back to human. Rachel pokes her head around the shed. You'd better stay here. You need to gather your strength if you're going to morph again. We'll come back when it's time. You lean against the storage shed and close your eyes. You concentrate on slow breathing, gathering your strength for the next morph. It's not long before the others return, but... They've been spotted. What are you doing back there? It's a human controller. Standing next to him is a hork bajir blade arms at the ready. A taxon stands on the other side, his spidery legs twitching, red jello eyes glowing. That makes it less scary. Suddenly, you notice something behind the guards. Rachel. Only it's Rachel with a long nose. And a trunk. She's morphing into an elephant. A braying noise fills the air as Rachel feels the elephant's power. She impales a hork bajir on one tusk <laughs> and steps on a taxon as though it were a spider. The human controller runs away. Let's morph! <laughs> boy, 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 this is where the theme song goes. Jake cries. You look over at Cassie. She's almost at the end of the pier. That gives you an extra burst of strength. You concentrate hard. Yes, there we go. You feel something grow out of the back of you. A tail. Your ears get round and your head gets big. Your teeth <laughs> sharpen into deadly instruments of terror. Are we a fair? You're fierce, you're fierce, hungry, and very angry hyena. And you have no fear. You start towards Cassie, but a taxon gets in your way. No problem. You rip him with your teeth. He tries to bite you back, but you're such an efficient killing machine that he's dead before he registers the pain. <laughs> Marco is now Big Jim, a huge gorilla. Rachel is trumpeting a fierce call as she mows down another hork bajir in Tiger Morph. Oh, wait, in Tiger Morph, Jake springs that attacks on. You own this place. Marco tosses another hork bajir in the air like a doll. The rest scatter. So they are afraid of something. Marco's the only one with dexterity, so he heads for the cages to unlock them. 
Jake is already bounding towards Cassie. You start forward to help, but the hork heads for you. He swipes at you with an elbow blade. You spring, you tear at his flesh, and jump away. You strike again, this time for the vulnerable fleshy part near his head. Wounded, you expect him to fall back, but instead he springs forward, his elbow and wrist blades flashing. Rachel raises a foot and stomps. Oh, thanks, you tell her. Another puny hork bites the dust, Rachel says. She sounds positively bloodthirsty. <laughs> okay. Tobias swoops down and claws at the eyes of the hork who's holding Cassie. She breaks away and runs. More! You yell along with Jake. Now! Even as you watch, Cassie's hair grows into a beautiful mane. It streams out behind her legs as her legs extend. <laughs> Sorry. There's mm -hmm. a sentence. <laughs> yep. And then she... And as she goes down on all fours, it's amazing to see. I say we follow Cassie out of here. Rachel says. I'm right behind you. You say. The people Marco have released are panicking, running towards the stairs. hork Bajir, Taxons try and round them up. You slip through them, running hard. Cassie and Jake leap over the surprise Taxons. And you remember that hork Bajir aren't great on strategy. So you fake left and go right. Sailing over a long pair of wrist blades that try and slash you at the last minute. You gain, on, you gain the stairs. Balls of flame explode over your head. You leap over a taxon who's aiming a Dracon beam at you. Yep. Straight Classic. into the path of a Vizier 3 and his Andalite form. That really is such a sci-fi pair of sentences. <laughs> the horrid evil voice fills your head. Well, if it isn't a bunch of renegade Andalites... He begins to morph into a creature as tall as a building, with eight legs, eight arms, and eight heads. You can feel that even the hyena inside you feels doubt. Yeah? You can't take on this creature. You can't escape! Vizier 3 cries. You filthy creep! It's Tom. Jake's brother launches himself at Vizier 3. No! Jake cries. He springs at the huge creature that is Vizier 3, straight towards the eyes. He claws at the face. Vizier how wait, Vizier 3 howls in pain. Fireballs explode. One almost gets Jake. Tom falls off the stairs. <laughs> Jake, run! <laughs> I will say, the fact that running at that giant, like, skyscraper's size beast. Mm -hmm. the, the downside being, Tom falls off the stairs. It's, <laughs> it's pretty tame. All things considered. <laughs> Jake run, Cassie cries urgently. With a howl of anguish, Jake turns and heads up the stairs. Rachel begins to demorph as she climbs so she can't so she can fit in the stairway. You can't run! Vizier 3 cries. Oh yes, you can. The stairway narrows. Vizier 3 hadn't counted on your making it that far. In his huge morph, he can't make it upstairs. You run and you run. Then you break through the janitor's door and back into the school. You keep running until you're outside in the safety of the trees. And then you all morph back, and you're safe for now. You look at your friends and see the same exhaustion on their faces. Even Marco can't come up with a joke. Cassie puts her hand over Jake's. Rachel stares back at the school building with her eyes blazing. Tobias flies closer and perches on her shoulder. You know that more terror lies ahead. You know that safety is an illusion, and you will never truly feel safe again. Oh my lord. And this is just like a another page. Excellent morph. Turn to page 37 for your next Animorph adventure. I mean, so my understanding is is of all of the heavy themes of Animorphs, like one of like one of the main ones is the effect of war on children. And yeah. That's quite encapsulated there, and you know more terror lies ahead. You know now that safety is an illusion. You will never truly feel safe again. Yeah. It is wild. Uh, oh my. Excellent morph. Yeah, here we go. Page 37. Chapter Pizza 16. for dinner? I'm sorry. Sorry, it's all good. Pizza for dinner? Your mom says, I just wanted pizza for dinner again. 
awesome, you say. It's a Saturday afternoon. You just returned from the mall. Sometimes you just need an ordinary day. You bet on plenty of missions with the Animorphs. Your close calls have given you nightmares. You're living in a world with new rules, and sometimes you think you'll go crazy. Sometimes you want to go crazy. Living with the stark terror every day that will do that to you. So whenever you can, you try and do something normal. As much as morphing into an osprey might be fun, it's not normal. Not by a long shot. So when you called Jake that morning to ask if anything was up, he just sighed. I say we take a day off from saving the world, he said. The smell of green peppers fills the kitchen. You watch your mom chop. She makes her own pizza, and it's the best in town. Can we have sausage on it? You ask. Mom grins. Sure, it's a Saturday. Let's live a little. You reach into the refrigerator for a soda, and... Flash! The heat presses against your skin. You can hear the call of birds and insects. Where did you guys go? Rachel asks. And where are we? Cassie wonders. And, uh, why don't I have shoes? Marco asks. Flash. And a nice green salad. Mom finishes. You know I've got to sneak something healthy in there. Your hand is cold. You look at the sweat beating up on the can. Oh, what's that about? It was so real. The heat had been just as, as intense as the cold in your fingers right now. Can you hand me that garlic? Mom asks. You nod and reach for a garlic bulb in the bowl on the counter. <laughs> you hand it to mom and... Flash. <laughs> really? A monkey morph? Marco says, lifting an eyebrow. Listen, I've been a gorilla. That'd be, you know, kind of a demotion, don't you think? Marco, I'm just wondering. Rachel says, her hands on her hips. Do you always have to make things difficult? Is it like your hobby or whatever? Hey, <laughs> it's my life! Marco says. Flash. Would you do me a favor and pick up some basil off the plant? Mom asks. Sweetie, are you okay? I'm okay, you say, but you're not. Something is really, truly wrong, and you have to find out what. It sounds like a Sario rip, Jake says worriedly. You've ridden as fast as you can on your bike to Jake's house. You have only half an hour before dinner. Axe is there, too, so we... Okay, this... I was wondering when he was going to come up. <laughs> so this... <laughs> this, I think, confirms what I suspected, which was... Uh, chapter 16 is the start of the end of the first book's retelling mm -hmm. and the beginning of the next section of the story. Mm -hmm. But they really do just jump because <laughs> we didn't... Hey. Axe was introduced in the same scene that we learned about the Duncan Ray. D D Deacon? Duncan? I can't remember them. <laughs> Deacon? I think it was Deacon Ray's. Was he really? No, uh, no. It's, neither of those were introduced. <laughs> okay, okay, that's what I thought. I just, I was like, did I, I mean, a lot has happened, but not this. <laughs> it's like, it's a lot has happened, and yet they still, Axe is there too, you know, mm -hmm. like. Your best friend Axe. Yeah, your best, you know, blue friend Axe, whatever, with, okay. Axe is there too, and he looks <laughs> like he's just as worried as Jake. He's been eating his very first licorice whip, and he'd been really enjoying it. But he stopped when you blurted out your story. <laughs> okay, Rita, what does an alien sound like? <laughs> I mean, usually it sounds like... I, I you mean, have, usually it sounds like this. <laughs> I mean... Oh, to it's be, just Stitch. All to, aliens are Stitch-ish. It is Stitch-ish. I will say we do have a canonical voice from you for... A creature of his species already and it was you know in the in our mind at the beginning the prince oh, mr yes. man so like that's the, the I two wrote, alien I wrote that down i wrote that down on my list as alien dash close and it's just get close to the microphone and speak <laughs> so that's i think we're gonna go with so, a, 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 a clearer indication this person is an alien and i will revert to uh, just, my initial no, pitch just if since it's not in the brain speak close but far <laughs> 
<laughs> Duh. <laughs> to speak close but further from the microphone. <laughs> not again. Oh, he says. Oh, no, not again, Prince Jake. This is not good. What's a Sario rib? You ask. Are you sure it was a jungle? Jake asks, instead of answering you. Or was it like a rainforest? Like, I can tell the difference. You ask. You're starting to feel impatient. Jake turns to Axe. But I reversed the rip? How can this happen? Axe shrugs and begins to chew on the end of the licorice. I don't know. When they taught about Saria rips in class, I was... <sighs> Not paying attention. Jake finishes impatiently. I know. Young Andalite females can do that. Axe says. He slurps up another inch of licorice. It tastes red. Red. Tastes red. Red. Duh. Cherry. <laughs> Jake says absently. It's cherry flavored. Not Will only... someone please fill me in? Sorry. No, it's, it's just. Sorry, I thought the next one was something I was going to say. I didn't mean to interrupt. I. Uh, not Dude. only has Axe been nonchalantly introduced, he's been introduced and has been around for so long that we are back sassing an alien. Mm-hmm. Like, he's and, like, been well integrated. responding to him, like, yeah. impatiently. Yeah, like, like, he's not the abject, like, curiosity of everyone. He just tells us lore about his world, and we're like, yeah, whatever. Yeah, okay, cool. Uh, it's, uh, it's Cherry, idiot. It's a Twizzler. Duh. Also... He's right. It doesn't taste like, does cherry. like cherry. It tastes, it tastes like red. red. It's true. Ooh, is uh, Jake a controller? Because I agree. Oh. Licorice tastes red, not cherry. Even cherry, like cherry licorice tastes even less like cherry. It's true. Yeah. A hundred percent. Well, someone please fill me in. You demand. Okay. So a Saria rip is like a hole in space time. Jake explains. We've all experienced it, except I'm the only one who remembers it. And that's because I died back there, but not in this time, so I was able to come back. Oh, thanks. You say? That clears it up. Uh, totally. The thing that Axe said is that you need some sort of huge explosion to blow your back. Jake says worriedly. I guess maybe it hasn't happened yet. Terrific. You say? Something to look forward to besides pizza. Nuclear annihilation. Unless we're in a rip right now. Axe puts in. A rip within a rip. Jake frowns. What does that mean? Axe shrugs. It could be his first shrug because he looks surprised at the motion. He does it again for practice. I do not know. I am just guessing. Want some licorice? He holds a piece out to you and flash. Chapter 17. The trees soar above your heads and the leaves make canopy so dense that it blocks out the sky. The heat presses against your skin. Whoa! Jake cries. What's going on? Wait. You say. You mean you know you're here? With me? It's the same place. Jake says, spinning around. Hang on. He darts through the trees and you and Axe follow. You stop abruptly when Jake does, bumping into him. In a small clearing is a bug fighter. It's scorched and trashed as though it crash landed. This is totally freaked. Jake whispers. I'll say. A voice says. It's Rachel who steps through the trees, Cassie and Marco at her side. Where did you guys go? And where are we? Cassie asks. Why don't I have shoes? Marco asks glumly, staring at his bare feet. I've been circling above, but all I see is a green canopy of trees. Tobias says in thought speak. He swoops down and lands on a tree trunk. I'd say we're in a rainforest. I can try and see if there's a city or a village nearby. There's no city, Jake mutters. Pray tell, uh, how do you know, oh fearless leader? Marco asks. I just do, Jake says. He frowns. The first thing we have to do is take that onboard navigating computer. Visor 3 will be coming back for the bug fighter. 
How do you know this stuff? Cassie asks. The last time I was on a bug ship, we were shooting Dracon beams at Visa 3. <laughs> it's a sorry or rip, Jake says. Quickly, he summarizes what has happened. So, how do we get back? Cassie asks. You can tell she's trying not to look scared. I'm not sure, Jake admits. Last time, I had to die. I don't especially want to do that again. Are you all thinking what I'm thinking? Axe asks suddenly. Marco rolls his eyes. <laughs> what are the odds of that? Think about it, Prince Jake. Axe continues. You have been given a second chance. Last time, you made mistakes. What I mean to say is, you made good decisions, but things went wrong. Thanks for trying to make me feel better, Axe, but you were right the first time. Jake says wryly. We walked right into Visor 3's trap. But this time, we will not walk into the trap. Axe points out. We know what is wrong to do. Now, we must do what is right to do. You're right, Axe! Jake says excitedly. We've been given a second chance. And the first thing we should do is not take the onboard computer. Can you just disable it instead? Make it look like it happened in the crash. But be sure that they can fix it. That'll slow them down while we follow through on a plan. I can do this, Prince Jake. Axe says, nodding. He takes off for the bug fighter. What plan? Marco asks. I mean... Call me crazy, but I got a feeling I'm not going to like this. It's simple, Jake says. We're going to sneak aboard the blade ship. Already? I don't like it. Marco interrupts, groaning. Turn to page. And destroy... What Sorry. Want? I'm faking it. There's not actually turn to page. But I feel It's wrong okay. You, it, you've it, done it, it now 40 r- times, so I should have realized at some no, point. No, <laughs> I skipped some because it's just like, it feels wrong that I'm not saying it. But I don't no, want to... I, I, I totally understand. I reworded part of the opening so that we could include Turn to Page in the opening yeah, as well. Yeah, but it's like, but the merch that doesn't exist. Um, <laughs> yeah, pa- page 41. And destroy Visor 3. Jake says grimly. Then we'll recreate the rip to get back to our own time. That sounds like a good plan. Rachel agrees. Es- Especially... The destroy Visor 3 part. Yes. No, I was reading your your part. <laughs> and then I stopped ah, okay. because I was bad. Of course you'd think so. Marco says. What do you need the morphin ability for? You, you're already an animal. The question is, what should we morph? Cassie asks. We have to get through the rainforest and we're barefoot, so... Oh, how about monkeys? Really? A monkey morph? Marco says, lifting an eyebrow. (sighs) Listen, I've been a gorilla. That'd be quite the demotion, don't you think? Marco, I'm just wondering. Rachel says, hands on her hips. Do you always have to make things difficult? Like, is it your hobby? It's his life. You say. Marco gives you a strange look. I I was just going to say that. I know. You say. Come on, guys. Jake says. We have decisions to make. We have to acquire morphs that will help us cope with the rainforest, but we also need morphs that will help us sneak aboard the blade ship. And we might need to be help of that. We might need the help of that tribe that you met last time. Axe says as he reappears. You said they were pretty helpful against the Hulk Vigier. What about using an ant morph again? What? You suggest you point to a tree. I read about those ants. They're called parasol ants. They can climb hundreds of feet. And we'd be so small, we'd sneak into the bug fighter with no problem. That's true, Cassie says reluctantly. No, 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 no way you might be in an ant again, Marco says, shuddering. <laughs> that was the worst. You all begin to argue about what morphs to acquire. But you're running out of time and you have only time for one morph. So you choose a monkey a parrot, or a parasol ant. I will say, again, I have... Mm. First of all, interesting note, they didn't mention parrot anywhere. Yes. Uh, Second of all, it was mentioned that we do things differently, and the parasol ant is not that. That is the same thing. So I don't... That's all I have. That's all I have. 
Oh, right, 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 right. I see. I, I, cause I was thinking like that might be in a past mission that we've done as the Animorphs rather than, yeah, uh, that's my guess. The, the thing in the previous rip. Oh, but I see what you're saying. I, I see don't, you're, yeah, I, I don't, don't know which know. way it is. I I, th I think, like, you know, Parrot is the one that's least mentioned, so I almost worry they can't make that the right choice. Yeah. I mean, it's not There's mentioned no... at all, in fact. Exactly. There's no offering but of it in the text. If it was offered in the text, it feels apt. Like, if we're trying to get on a flying ship, mm -hmm. it seems like a good choice. But and it helps you cope with the rainforest. You don't really have to touch the ground at all, and you can cover quite a lot of distance quite quickly. Yeah, so, like, it's basically, like, I think a parrot... I, mean, I will say a, a monkey seems wrong. Mm-hmm. I don't know why. A monkey no seems, stealth in a monkey. It, it seems... In, no stealth in a monkey. That's what I always say. I That one feels incorrect. I could go either way on the other two. Let's go for parrot because of the 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 element that it's lesser mentioned, and also the fact that it can cover more ground. And if it's wrong, we get to see what being wrong is like. Or maybe these are. Exactly. I, I'm assuming that there are wrong choices, and we're just like killing it. Is my guess. I I did check one of the alternatives on a previous thing, and oh. there are wrong choices. Oh. If for instance, if we turned into the giraffe, uh, we just would have been eaten. Oh. The, the, a lion would have just been like, ah, oh, snack, yum. Well then, okay. Well, we should choose a wrong answer sometime here. Maybe it's parrot. Let's see. Mm -hmm. You don't have the same wing strength as a bird of prey, but at least you can fly. The parrot morph allows you to soar just underneath the canopy. Your green feathers offer cam camouflage. I like this morph, Cassie says. I really feel like I belong here. Yeah, just as long as Tobias doesn't eat it up for lunch. Marco says, dipping under a tree branch and then soaring upwards. I'm sure getting a workout, Jake says. This isn't like being a falcon and soaring with the thermals. You really have to work. <laughs> yeah, well, get it, girl. Marco teases. How do you know I'm a girl? Jake asks. Because that red tail is so adorable. Marco answers. Everyone laugh, but it comes out in parrot speak. <coughs> It feels good to laugh, even if you're doing it in a thick, curved beak. Pipe down, you guys. Tobias warns. I see them. Tobias has been flying ahead of the group with his superior eyesight and wing power. He's able to see the hork from far away. They're destroying everything! Tobias suddenly shouts. They must have gotten bored of just looking there, slashing and burning! Okay, fade back, Tobias. Jake warns. We'll take over. They just killed a sloth and her babies! Tobias continues. For nothing! Those murderers! Now, Tobias! Jake shouts. In another moment, you see a blur of brown feathers. Tobias drops onto a branch. They're killing everything that moves, he says in disbelief. That is what the Yooks are best at, Axe says quietly. You leave Tobias behind and fly ahead. You hear the hork bajir before you see them. Dracon beams sizzle. The smell of burnt things fill the air, and you hear cries of what sounds like thousands of birds and fellow creatures trying to flee. Guys? It's Rachel, who's spurted ahead, her wings just a blur of motion. I think I see something. Look down by that weird tree. Turn to page four, back. Jeez. Thanks, Rach. <laughs> that really narrows it down. Marco says. Okay, fine. The one with the roots. Rachel says impatiently. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah! Thanks, oh. Rachel! You look down and you see nothing, just branches and leaves, but then the leaves move and you see another person concealed behind them. He's holding a spear. And then you see another. And another. You found the tribe. They're spying on the hawk Vigier. Cassie whispers. It's funny how you sometimes feel a need to whisper even though you're talking in thought speak. I have a plan, Jake says. Follow me and do what I do. He swoops down and lands on the shoulder of one of the tribe. They are men and boys, all with dark hair and alert dark eyes. They're wearing something that looks like a diaper made out of leaves. 
Okay. You swoop down on another shoulder, and Rachel, Rachel, Rachel follows one L. Then Cassie, Marco, Axe, Tobias flutters down and lands on a low branch. The tribe does nothing. They don't even move a muscle. But you see every pair of eyes turn to one man. He's either your age or your grandfather's. It's hard to tell. Cassie? Jake says. You morph. Cassie doesn't even ask why. She flies to the center of the clearing. You wonder why he's chosen Cassie, but as Cassie begins to morph, you understand. Cassie can control her morph and so that she changes gracefully. She's not scary. She's beautiful. She retains her bright feathers as she grows. She changes her face first so that she's a bird girl. Her tail retracts, but her feathered wings still flutter. And slowly her feathers turn to smooth skin, starting with her feet and moving up her body. And again, the tribe does not move. They don't raise their spears. Espirito. The leader says. He uh, just called her a spirit? Marco translates. Cassie, nod. Jake directs. Cassie nods. She holds out her arms as though she's gathering the tribe to her. It's a welcoming gesture, but you realize she's telling them not to be afraid. Now, draw a hawk bajir with a stick. Jake tells her. Turn to page 46. Cassie bends over and draws the hawk bajir in the dust. It's not a great drawing. Don't roast. But the hawk bajir are pretty distinctive. Diablo. The leader says. Devil. Marco says. Cassie nods. Now, draw the blade ship. Jake directs. They need to understand that we have to get aboard. Cassie draws the blade ship and she points herself and the ship. She points to herself and the ship and then she points to the leader and stabs the hork bajir with a stick. The leader grins. He throws his spear. Cassie! Rachel cries. But the spear just misses Cassie and lands at her feet, straight into the center of the hork bajir drawing. Cassie smiles. The leader smiles. You all say, (laughs) Cassie needs time to recover from her morph, so you all rest in human form. With combination of signs and pointing, Cassie's arranged to meet up with the tribe again, just as dusk falls. Your parrot morph was successful. You met up with the tribe and escaped the notice of the hork bajir But you need another morph to sneak aboard the blade ship. So choose. A chameleon, a poison arrow frog, or the ever-stealthy invisible jaguar. Mm. (laughs) Which of these do we think would help us with stealth more? The one after whom many stealth things are named? The poison arrow frog? Or the jaguar? I, there's an obvious, dumb, obvious pull. But. Do you want to make a a wrong choice? (laughs) I. That's kind of just where, that's where I'm at, which is just, yeah. also, I kind of, I'm metagaming for a second. I know there's 60 pages in this book. Mm-hmm. Uh, I also know that Poison <laughs> Arrow Frog, <laughs> Poison Arrow Frog is on page 58, and Jaguar is on page 59. <laughs> <laughs> I, <laughs> mm, I smell success. Let's. It's not going to lose our streak because we have expertly deduced that. Um, but let's let's go see what a loss looks like. What do you, which which loss do you want? It's got to be the... Ooh, I was about to say it's got to be the Poison Arrow Frog, but it could... Hmm. I think... To sneak aboard? Poison, see, Frog could still be a reasonable-ish kind of choice, but I just don't see Jaguar as like a... Yeah. Anything... What do you think? Uh, let's go to 50, 58 so that we can remember. Let's do it. 48. All poison right. arrow frog. The poison arrow frogs are a good cover. With your powerful hind legs, you leap through the rainforest to the side of the blade ship. You lurk underneath a bush waiting for Tobias' signal. They've started fighting, Tobias says. Where are you? I can't see you. To the right of the blade ship, you say. Underneath that bush with the pointy leaves, Cassie adds. I still can't see you, and I can't find Visit 3. He could be in a new morph, Tobias says. Watch, you say. You hop out a few feet into the clearing. Okay, got you, Tobias says. You'd better circle to the other side. There's Hawk Bajir in your vicinity. You hop back. Together with the others, you make your way around the ship, 
Around you, you can hear the hork crashing through the rainforest. Every so often, you hear the sizzle of dracon beams. It begins to rain. You're thirsty. And your frog, frog brain clamors for water. You hop forward and stick out your tongue. The water feel, feels cool, and you swallow grace, gratefully. The rain feels good, you say. What rain? Tobias asks. The brownish-greenish creature suddenly detaches itself from the tree. It appears to have no bones. But at the end of its five arms are sprinkler-like holes, and they're spraying you with water. It is a behorn! Axe cries. Look out for its... A three-foot-wide, wi sticky pink tongue suddenly shoots out of the creature's mouth, and it laps you like cream. You thrash about, but you can't escape as the tongue shoots you backwards into the waiting mouth. Frog's legs! Delicious! Visor 3 says. And slurp, you're finished. Well... Yep. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, let's let's hope he gets a little bit of a tummy ache. We're a poison arrow frog. We're a little bit uh, poison. Yeah, that's. I mean, you would think. Uh, so you want to go back? I was to about 46? to clarify uh, that we're a poison arrow frog. We're a little bit venomous, but no, we are poisonous. It's true. Uh, for back it's, to forty six or? Oh yeah, back to forty six, and then across to forty eight. Let's yeah. do it. I was just wondering if we had enough failure yet or not. But I am good to go to the correct path now. I. Now that we have seen defeat, it is it's vaguely goosebumpish at the end. Like it, it does get that little one liner mm -hmm. in mm, frogs. Like it, like it still has that mm -hmm. kind of the little zinger. First, your skin turns green. Are we Martians or reptiles? Marco is just able to get out before he's unable to speak. The rest of his complaints sound like ack ack. Oh, I love this tail. Cassie thought speaks. You know what she means. A chameleon's tail is almost like a monkey, curled and strong. You roll your eyes, one goes left, the other right. You can get a 180 degree view without turning your head. You follow behind the others as you make your way to the perimeter of the landing site. Okay, remember, when you see Visor 3 in the window of the blade ship, it's only a decoy, Jake says. That's what he did in the last Sario rip. So all we have to do is to come at the ship from behind. And meanwhile, the tribe will cover us with a diversion. If all goes as you've planned, you say. Which it never does, Marco adds. The tribe is in place, Tobias tells you. Visa 3 is in Lurdathak mode. I can see the vines moving. Jake has told you about Visa 3's morph. The Lurdathak is as tall as a tree. It has hundreds of vine-like tentacles. They can strike like whips and squeeze all of the breath out of you, then the Lurdathak can just pop you up into its cavernous mouth like a good and plenty. It's an experience you're happy to skip. It's dusk, Cassie observes. Time for the tribe to attack. Your coloring protects you as you scurry along the floor. You belong to the forest, are part of the forest. Born by the forest, molded by it. You can hear the sound of the hork in the forest. You can hear the sound of the hork in the distance. But you're quick and agile and unafraid. You let the chameleon's instincts take or <laughs> Because if you let the human mind start to think, it'll fill up with fear. You're running towards Vizier 3 and not away from him. The tribe is attacking. Tobias, the lookout, tells you. They keep melting back into the forest. The Hawk Bajir going crazy. Turn to page 49. Get onto the blade ship, Tobias. Jake urges while he runs. Do it. You are running flat out now. A chameleon can't run very fast. Not as fast as a jaguar. Hmm. Well, how did that go? Uh, but you reach the burned out clearing. The blade ship looms ahead. Jake goes first, then Rachel, one by one, moving as fast as you dare, but keeping to the dark green shadows. You approach the huge black ship. The gangway is down and you scamper up it, then keep to the side of the walls of the ship. Tobias? Jake asks. I'm here, up high in the rafters. You roll your eyes up, and you can barely make out Tobias. You're all changing color, Tobias observes. You're getting darker. May I make a pr suggestion, Prince Jake? Axe says. Perhaps we should scatter. One chameleon might have wandered aboard, but not six. Good point, Jake agrees. 
Let's find separate positions. We'll have to wait until the ship goes back to the same space position and fires its rockets. Then we should land back in our own time. What about visit three? Axe asks. When do we destroy him? Rachel asks. Like, shouldn't we pick a place to hide and morph into something really dangerous? Then we can, like, take him by surprise. Jake hesitates. Wasn't that the plan? Rachel asks urgently. I'm not so sure, Jake says. It might be too dangerous. Maybe we should just let Visor 3 blast us back into our own time. But we'll lose our chance, Rachel argues. Yeah, I'm with Jake, Marco says. If we live, we can come back and fight another day. I'll go with you, whatever you all decide, Cassie says. If I can get a word in, Tobias says. The ship is constantly patrolled, and the bridge is full of taxons. We might be able to take down Visa 3 if we're incredibly lucky, but that doesn't mean we'll survive. Axe. Jake asks. Turn to page 50. Visa 3 killed my brother. He is my sworn enemy. Axe says. I will meet with him someday. It may not be today. I will follow your decision, Prince Jake. Ah, oh, I wish you didn't say that. Jake groans. It's this Sario rip that's complicating things. You say? We don't know if we'll make it back. We don't know if we're part of someone's memory. If we kill Visa 3 now in this time, what happens to us in real time? This is all way too confusing. Cassie sighs. I need a nap. Marco says. And I haven't had that since I was uh, three years old. Let's hide. Jake says finally. We still have time to decide, and time is running out for Visor 3. He can't afford to chase that tribe around the forest any longer. The six of you melt behind a console. You space yourselves apart. But within thought-speaking distance, I didn't know there was a limit. Yes, evidently. Leave them! A terrible voice invades your head. If you had hands, you'd put them over your ears. Chameleons have hands. I mean... Am I wrong? <laughs> Sorry, no, they have paws. <laughs> that's a... Yep, yep, sure. That's right, Goosebumps. Uh, when Visitor 3 talks in thought speak, it feels as if your whole brain shudders. Leave them behind! Visitor 3 continues. He's back in the Andalite morph. It is not the punishment those Andalites deserve, but... It will have to be enough. Visor 3 places himself in one of the chairs on the bridge. Now, take off, you worthless slime! He says to the taxon captain. A message crackles over the communication system. Bug fighter, ready for takeoff. So take off, fool! Visor 3 roars in thought speak. You can feel the great ship rise, but you can't see anything. You feel a burst of optimism that feels like the first step towards home. Axe, keep track of time for us. Jake advises in private thought speak. <laughs> what? So they have a private channel, but this one is just like, no. <laughs> <laughs> I guess. I will, Prince Jake. Axe says. But there's no telling when Visor 3 will order the double blast. <laughs> the bugfighter and the blade ship will have to intersect those Dracon beams. Uh -huh. Perhaps they have already agreed on a coordinate. There is no way of knowing. Which means, Rachel says, that if we do want to attack Visor 3, we'd better do it soon. All right, Jake says. M maybe we should. He's cut off by the bleeding of Visor 3 shouting. No! Turn to page 51. I, I do love the sentence. Where is it? Uh, there's no telling when Visor 3 will order the double blast. It could also be just as easily be a fast food order. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's uh, that's when they give you Mountain Dew and uh, yes. code, code Red in the same glop. Wait a minute. Yeah. Hello? Did I lose you? Hello? Oh, I thought I lost you. No? We're good. I was All just right. trying to think of a different kind of Mountain Dew, and I think there's a Mountain Dew Code Red. Yeah, there's a Code Red. I thought you were going to say Baja Blast because of the blast. 
that would make that's I think that's how I got in that area, and then I just deleted Baja Blast from my mind and had to find some other substitute. Yeah. Either way, the blast rocks you. The Baja Blast. Flash. It would. You're in the front quad of outside school. You're wearing a sweater that you hadn't worn since last year. Ahead of you is the bus stop, and you see the patrolman Teeter directing traffic. He retired last summer. You turn. Rachel's back on the steps of the school. Her hair is a good four inches shorter. She touches it, frowning. She wore it that way last year. You've gone back in time like you should have, but you've overshot your time. You're a year too early. Chapter 22. What's going on? You say. This isn't a flashback. It's going on too long, but it doesn't feel real either. Oh, man. Marco says. Does this mean I have to go through homeroom with Miss Podolsky again? <laughs> Something's wrong. You say. Just then, a car pulls up to the curb and a window slides down. Marco's mother waves at him. Hi, honey. I thought I'd give you a ride. Next to you, Marco's gone completely still. His mother's dead. That's what everyone thinks, anyways. Only you, Jake, and Axe know that Marco's mother was taken over by the Yerks. She is Visor 3's rival, Visor 1. Okay? Marco takes a step forward, and he moves stiffly, like he's frozen. You can see tears in his eyes. His mom is so alive! <laughs> She's so alive! That's... <laughs> You can see tears in his eyes. His mom is so alive. <laughs> All right. A breeze lifts her heavy, dark hair. Her hand rests on the open window, and her wedding ring glints in the sun. Come on, Slowpoke. She teases. Have you got lead in your shoes? Mom. Marco whispers. Marco's mom swings the door open and steps out onto the curb. It's as though everything is in slow motion. And you're shocked to see her so alive, warm and happy. Turn to page 52. So it takes you longer than it should to see the pit bull <laughs> that runs across the grass towards her. What? Then you hear the voice that haunts your nightmares. I will end it here. Marco. You cry. It's Visa 3. Marco starts to run, but you know in a split second that you can't fight this dog. Not as a human, anyway. He's too far away. You only have seconds to try and morph, so you choose. A hyena, a canine dog, or a giraffe. Oh, I hate to meta. Oh, I'd love to hear the meta. It's... It's... It's pretty cheesy. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's the same meta as last time. <laughs> take a look oh, at the... Oh, as in... Take a look at the page numbers. On Yes, hyenas on page 53, canine on 54, and giraffe on 55. I do Unless, wonder if there's the possibility yes. that they go like, yo, know, it's the hyena page, but then that and says then it go jumps to 56. To 56. There, that is very possible. That is very possible. So let's, let's rule that out for a second and say, what do you think is the most logical in this scenario? So there is a small part of my soul that says like, hyenas... Like that, like their whole thing is they have no fear. Like they will happily try and take down a rhinoceros. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. but also pit bulls are like mm -hmm. notoriously, uh, notoriously determined in their yes. aggression as mm -hmm. dogs. So I wonder if maybe a canine dog would not be great. Maybe the German Shepherd would kind of get torn apart a little bit. Yeah. Also, I, I feel like that's. If if I wasn't meditating at all, I would say the K9 mm. seems like the... It's, it's the last one I would pick of the three. Yes. And the giraffe just feels like we would be very big, and that's a distraction more than anything else. Yeah. It... Or, yeah, I mean, hey, maybe that's the angle. Maybe it's like, you're a giraffe, and it's like, ah, the Animorphs, I see you now. You know? Mm. Something like that. I don't Who knows? But do you want to... For humor's sake, because we pro probably, if it wasn't for the meddling, would do 53, Hyena? I agree, yeah. Yeah. If it, if it wasn't for the meddling, I, I would say 53, so let's do that one first. It's the fastest you've ever morphed. Maybe panic helps you. Your powerful hind legs develop first, then your face flattens, your teeth grow, you feel the power in your muscles, you feel the urge to make your kill. 
The dog is on Marco's mother, tears at the arm she flings up to protect her throat. The pit bull's no match for you, a killing machine. You leap forward with the high-pitched, almost human cry of the animal. Raps, we want to take this one? <laughs> Your teeth find the pit bull's leg, and you chomp down and hit bone. Snarling, the pit bull turns, exposes the neck, and you pounce. You have the Visor 3 in your jaws. You save at the moment. What you didn't count on was Patrolman Teeter. He has been on school beat for ten years. He loves the kids and protects them from bullies, stray dogs, and fast cars. He certainly isn't going to let a hyena endanger them. He runs up behind you and pulls out his gun. Bang! You are dead. What? Bad Morph. You should have thought about Patrolman Teeter. <laughs> That's what it says. Bad Morph, you should have thought about Patrolman Teeter. Visitor 3 is still alive and you're just a dead hyena. Why is he not shooting? I mean, just get him. Like, if you're shooting a hyena, he's literally killing that woman. <laughs> I mean, I'm just like, the in this scenario where you're going to shoot one of them, I don't. he's protecting... At least shoot both. He's protecting... <laughs> he's a... I mean... I love dogs. Mm. He is a patrolman for kids. He loves the kids and protects them from bullies, stray dogs, and fast cars. I. <laughs> he is protecting. I just a... love the idea of. He's protecting the car dog. just going sixty past, and he shoots it. <laughs> you never counted on patrolman <laughs> Tater. <laughs> Get back here, you feeb. <laughs> All right. He's using one of those uh, speed test guns, but just fires a bullet out of it. <laughs> I, love, I love that. All right, all right, all right. You want a giraffe? He, he does protect against stray dogs. I wonder if we might have a similar end if we were the canine unit. Oh. But if we were a giraffe... <laughs> he does not protect against giraffes. He doesn't protect against giraffes. And the other thing is a dog. Maybe we just become a giraffe and he's like... Giraffe, yep. that's completely normal. But there's a pit bull. <laughs> bang, 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 bang. <laughs> All right. 55 it is. Chapter 25, it. which seems like a good sign if we didn't already assume. You leap behind a tree and accomplish your giraffe morph. Your legs grow so rapidly that you crack your head on a branch. Your neck stretches. Your skin is patterned with tan and brown. With a clatter of hooves, you take off towards Marco's mother. There you are in three powerful strides. Giraffes are peaceful creatures. Patrolman Teeter is stunned to see one appear, but he doesn't go for his gun. He would never shoot a giraffe. What is this? Why does he that would, would never. Why does he? Why does the patrolman? What is it? Why does he need a he, gun? So, I I can only imagine the patrolman Tita at some point downloaded a list of all of the animals and just went through them like shoot, hesitate, don't shoot. Just yeah, pretty much, I'd say so. This is I all, mean, hey, this he is has to make split Tita's second no shoot list. Yep. Exactly. If he's got to make split second decisions like that, it's much easier if he has just like a lookup table in his head that he can go to. Yeah. Oh. Yep, Patrolman Teeter's stunned to see what appear, but he doesn't go for his gun. He would, ne he would never shoot a giraffe. You turn your back to the... I also love how, like, the audacity of the book to say, we should have considered that angle. <laughs> 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 it's just... Wow. You turn your back to the dog to give yourself greater kicking power. He launches himself at you, but he can only reach your leg. You shake him off, and you pull back your leg, and wham! You knock Vizier 3 into next week and flash. Onions on it too? Mom asks you. She's stirring the pot of tomato sauce on the kitchen stove. She turns when you don't answer. Sweetie, do you want onions on your pizza? Uh, uh, sure, you say. Everything, but I have to go to Jake's for a moment. I forgot my homework? It's Saturday. Yeah, you say and run out. Ask him over for dinner! Your mom yells as you hop on your bike. You ride like the wind. You find Jake and Axe in the bedroom, and Axe is only halfway through his licorice whip. You spill out your story. We were all there? Jake asks. And I knew I was in a second sorry or rip? You nod. 
And we went back in time. Marco and I both knew we were in the wrong time. And Marco knew his mother was, was dead and gone and whatever. Jake looks at Axe. Does any of this make sense to you? Axe chews on the licorice and swallows. No. Except for the motive of Vizzer 3. He manipulated the Sario Rip to go further back in time. He knew it would happen? Jake asks. Turn to page 56. He was trying to kill his enemy's host before it became the host. Axe explains. You see, some hosts are better than others. Obviously, Visor 1 had found a host that has extraordinary abilities. I also guess that Visor 3 might have known you were aboard in some kind of morphs. That was a trap. Since he thinks you were Andalites, perhaps he thought he could send you back. That way, he would be prepared that night when my brother, Elfangor, landed. He would make sure to kill you. Or else you would not be there at all. Alter the past, alter the future. He was willing to take that risk. Jake groans. Ah, uh, so I fell into another trap in the Amazon? Swell. I can't even be smart in someone else's Sario lift. It's a rip, Prince Jake, but it <laughs> turned out well. Axe points out. Visor 3 was stopped by the giraffe morph. This is why the whole thing never happened. He returned to the original time of the rip so that he wouldn't be stopped. The good news is that Marco's mother was not killed. So Visor 1 is still Visor 3's enemy, which is good for us. To have them fighting for power distracts Visor 3. But I don't get it. You say? If I was in Visor 3's rip, why do I remember it? And why did you and Jake remember some of it back in the Amazon? Axe thoughtfully braids a licorice ribbon and then bites off a piece. Muff. <laughs> is that Andalite language? Jake asks. No. It's a mouthful of licorice. Axe responds. The answer is, I do not know. My guess is that there can be braids in the rip. Like this. He holds up a braid of licorice. Light shines through the holes. I was not paying attention. The day Sario rips were taught. You finish. We know. Axe shrugs. Something we might figure it out. Someday we might figure it out. But you are alive. You saved Marco's mother. That is the important thing. We have lived to fight another day. Axe is right, Jake tells you. You have to take what you can get these days. Worry about the things you can do something about. You're alive and so are we. You know he's right. You have to take the moment, but you're safe. You may not have killed Visor 3, but you're back in your own time alive. Jake puts his hand on your shoulder. Don't worry, there will still be more battles to fight. You grin. But first, you say, there's pizza. Ba -da -ba -ba. And the uh, end of the book. <laughs> Final page, that's it. We the have end. done it. We have done it fairly successfully, might I add, aside from diverging to uh, for kicks and wiggles. Uh, wow. That's wild. That is a wild little thing right there. How how do you feel? The person feel who uh, the the person who transcribed this uh, had a small edit at the end of the Jaguar uh, story, which is to say, at the end of the Jaguar story, you lose, but it doesn't make you go back. <laughs> oh my god, I, dear R A F ers, I believe the author meant for you to return and finish the adventure victoriously. But forgot to mention that you as the reader should return to the page. Whatever. So here it is. Return to page 46 and try again. From Miss Asilla, 2007. Thank you, Miss Asilla. <laughs> oh my gosh. That's so good. I, man, it truly, it, it's, it does take itself very seriously in kind of a silly, mm. fun way. And... Mm. I will say, like, the parts when the, the parts that when, when you morph into an animal and the way they talk about turning, like, actually turning into the animal and your, like, immediate senses changing everything like that, it, it really does feel like it's where it's at the most fun. And then they slapped on, like, but we need, like, we need, like, three more layers of sci fi. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then, and I'm like, okay, Vizier 3, Double Blast, Photon, 
Beam, Vizor, uh, 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 Rip, S Sario Rip. And I do think it's an interesting <laughs> thing. Dracon Beam. Dracon Beam. Yeah, so there is very distinctly in this book, there was like, you can start the book knowing nothing and get to like the middle point knowing nothing. And then it very inexplicably just does a full on jump to a completely different time and story without explaining lots of things in a very strange way. <laughs> I did like at the very least though, that like, you know, that, that felt a little bit jarring, but then it was, you know, that made sense yes. in a way because we were experiencing things non-linearly because we were inside of Asario Rip, which was part of the ploy of Visit 3. I do like that because, like, you know, it, it almost reminds me a little bit of, of when I started Half-Life 2 after I'd finished Half-Life 1. And I, you know, load it up and there's a big train and then Dr. Breen is talking to me and I'm mm -hmm. standing there going, what the hell happened to Earth? Because, like, the Zen invasion happened between Half-Life 1 and Half-Life 2 and the, the seven-hour war? I think it's seven-hour war? Maybe seven-minute war? Anyhow, all this to say that I had that same feeling in uh, HL2 where uh, none of this makes sense to me and then eventually someone explained why it doesn't make sense to me. Yeah. Yeah. why that's okay and that allowed me to immerse myself in the universe anew yeah i think that, and i think that's valid and i but it's like it feels like the rip goes back to the point where we're in the kitchen knowing acts already i think mm. that there is just this i think and it is this part where it's like i almost wish it was integrated more that it was clear that we like i don't know t time traveled whatever the beginning of the book was time traveling backwards or something. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like, I feel like if it was made more mm. uh, integrated that way, because it was just, here's the first story. And then we had a summer where we went on lots of adventures. Here's six things that you, you won't know about if you didn't read the other series, but you don't need to read the other series for this. But it also is like, it seems like it'd be, it seems like you should. <laughs> it's kind of mm -hmm. like, but I, I do feel like I understand the, the gist of all of it. And then there's just like little nods here and there that you would probably appreciate more if you knew the alternate reality of what had happened in this event, I would imagine. Mm -hmm. uh, but still, I like the writing style of a lot of it. I do think is it is interesting how it's to the same target audience in the same time, everything like that. But it really does feel quite distinctly different from Goosebumps while still being that kind of 90s like... 90s young adult snark but mm -hmm. but it's a very it's like a very noticeably different flavor which i think is interesting yeah anytime they do something horrific like you know uh, the worm taking over someone's brain for instance uh, they don't then immediately require the ability to undercut it for the sake of it yeah. not being too horrifying and yeah. I, I i definitely definitely appreciate that yeah, I think like, I will say it, it, I think that that element makes sense when you factor in that it's a contiguous thing and they want you to have, be invested in stakes. Cuz like mm. if they if you had to care about like the goosebumps story was a long continuous thing the next like if they went six times and went, well, two heads are better than none, and they cut your head off. It's like, it, it's just, if they keep on doing that every time anything bad happens, um, you just wouldn't, you wouldn't care by the eighth, you know, time or whatever. Like, yeah. I, and I, I think that that's the kind of thing where like, they probably had the idea that this, the alternative morphs would go on for more than two books. If I were to hazard a guess. Hmm. But I don't know. I, I can only assume. I can only assume. Usually you don't set out for a new thing like that and make only two books. Uh, yeah. But, hey, I, I will say um, I don't think it's as bad as people said. I don't think it's like, you know, is it a master class? Yes. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> is it a work of art? Of course. Uh, it, Would I it... sell every worldly possession I own in order to simply be in the presence of Are the original version of this book? Obviously, <laughs> without a doubt. What'll it, what'll you pay? <laughs> uh, but yeah, no, I, I think that uh, yeah, it, it's it's in the same. I think it is in the same general space of Goosebumps, taking itself more seriously, 
leaning a little bit silly hard on the sci-fi in a way that probably would land better had you, like in the main series where you mm. are building on it and less thrust up thrust in it but yeah you have any other thoughts on it i mean i will make the the one obvious critique mm. which is ah, uh yes as a as a choose there a are book. no divergent paths whatsoever this yes. is a a single timeline with a couple of frayed branches that yes. all end immediately in deaths so i just went and quickly yes. checked i i do not like that format for it and i think it's an interesting choice that's kind of like also the fact that many times in the story they're like you really should make a decision between this but then not offering that choice because mm -hmm. they decided to i don't know if it was like because it would pitch the the book in a, in a clean light like you decide the morphs into kind of like distinctive make it more distinct or something from other books instead of like mm -hmm. you decide how whatever how the story ends like you decide the morphs because that is like the most compelling thing of animals but i think that they unnecessarily handcuff that to being the only choices that are made as yeah. well like so not only i think that that is two two layers of it on top of it and also like you know i i think some things that i saw people were upset are like well some of the choices for you know what happens it doesn't make a whole lot of sense it's like i you know we've read a lot of goosebumps like we to the point so i'm i'm numb to the fact that you know you should have considered uh patrolman theater like i'm numb i'm numb to that that doesn't bother me in the same way that it bothers other people i guess uh just because mm -hmm. of how built up we are to that but i will say yeah i if given the choice between a choose your own adventure book where it is just one one story with divergent paths that are failures or you know the x different endings i would definitely go with the x different endings anytime uh mm. for sure however i it was a I fun would have accepted one canon ending but yes. slightly different ways to get agreed. there as well like i agree yeah. but if it's just it is just one correct path everything else is failure is is rough but because it's like i don't know if that's be like oh because at the beginning it says you're gonna need help it's like well you're saying that I mean, like, there's not actually, especially everything that brings you back to the same path, even in mm. like in Goosebumps, the implication is like, oh, you're done with the book, and and it's just like, I don't know, it, you're you're always going to the same place, and it does. I will say it was a nice way to immerse myself headfirst into the world of Animorphs, because I feel like it that really yeah. does give you it gives you a crash course on the first book really quickly. And mm -hmm. uh, and then it dives you deep in kind of like the middle of what it might feel like later. And I will say the distinct there's a distinct mood shift in that at that halfway point as well. Mm -hmm. Like everyone Definitely. just is a lot more chummy and it, it starts to like they start to get a little goofier with it and stuff like that. Uh, but also going even 10 layers deep on the sci fi element at the same time in a way where mm -hmm. it's like, I bet you the books truly do get absolutely off the rails. <laughs> As they go on, I'm sure. As they keep on adding rules and and new elements and stuff like that. Yep. With this as the set trajectory, I can only imagine. Yeah. Either way, regardless, I had a lot of fun with it. That that I know for sure. Same. Uh, but hey, any other final final thoughts before we move on to uh to closing around? It's been two hours plus. I don't necessarily have any, but I do have, however. <laughs> Yes. A special thanks for the executive producer of this episode, Yoa. Thank you very much for the support over on patreon.com slash turn to pagecast. Much appreciated. Thank you so much. What a special episode, too. The the honor. I guard was what, what's it? Patrolman Teeter would not shoot. <laughs> what an honor. Hmm. <laughs> the picture comes up. No shoot. Thumbs he gives a little like a little cartoon and face of himself and the thumbs up. Patrolman Teeter approved. Patrolman Teeter approved. Uh, but hey, yeah, uh, alas, there's, I guess, other things at the end. We have a YouTube channel. If you want to go, I mean, I don't know at this point, so especially worth mentioning, 
We are at the point of recording not past 500 subscribers on the YouTube channel, which is a really special threshold. It's when the channel could be partnered and we can start, you know, monetizing things like that and hopefully use that to help make the show better than it is right now. So if you want to help with that, youtube.com slash at turn to page cast pop over there. Maybe you can be the number 500, et cetera, et cetera. Help us out with that. It'd be wonderful. Uh, any other ways they can help reps? It's also a particularly large help uh, if you have the predilection to do so, uh, to rate the podcast on any of the sites, apps, etc. that you should use to listen to it. It does help get it into new ear holes. Another way to do that also would be if you know anyone who happens to like these kinds of things, maybe has fond memories of the Scholastic, maybe is you know, au fait with podcasts in the general realm, recommending it to a friend. Word of mouth yeah. is possibly one of the strongest ways to uh, get a recommendation from another person, and that would be much appreciated if that's the kind of thing that you can do. It's true. The number one way I do anything is someone tells me to. 100%. <laughs> 100%. Uh, but alas, that's that. That's going to do it here for today. Uh, again, huge thank you to all of our wonderful supporters on Patreon, patreon.com slash turn to page cast, helping to make a better show a reality, doing cool things like getting the fun Animorphs art for this episode and the following episode next week. We're going to be doing the second episode on Animorphs, oh, sorry, Alternamorphs, before returning back to the Give Yourself Goosebumps books to finish up the special edition, which is going to be mm. a very exciting thing as well. So, hey, if you want to help make the show better, patreon.com slash turn to pagecast. That money is just straight funneled back into the show at 100% ratio. If you want to help out with that, that is a great way to do it. Thank you for watching, listening. I guess if it's on YouTube, you're watching, but you're watching a listen. If you know, you know, <laughs> you're watching a listen. Or you could listen a watch. Uh, I'm going to leave because I think I'm going through one of those uh, fancy, fancy uh, time loops myself. Uh, what is it? A rift? Sorry, a rip. Oh, yes. my. <laughs> Sorry. I, I've got a feeb brain. Oh, my goodness. Uh, <laughs> but, hey, we'll uh, catch you next time. Bye. Adios, y'all. <laughs>